I want to build up in stages how we might make a molecule like this stereo selectively. There are a few things we need to control. We can observe that there's three stereo centers. So therefore there's a possible two to the power of three, which is eight stereoisomers. Of those stereoisomers, we can look at the relationships between the stereo centers. And as indicated in those arrows, there's two relative stereochemical relationships. So these eight stereoisomers are gonna be comprised of four diastereomers with each possible pair of relationships. Think like sin-sin, sin-anti, anti-sin, like that. And due to the lack of symmetry, each will exist as two enantiomers or also called optical isomers. So the first challenge to assess is how do we assemble the atoms in the right place? How do we assemble the carbon skeleton? And here, just to keep things simple, I'm going to ignore stereochemistry first. The next most complex stage would be to think about how we make this diastereo selective, as in picking one of the four diastereomers. Then the third step in this process would be to think about, now that we've been able to make one of the diastereomers, can we make one enantiomer of the diastereomer selectively? So can we make our synthesis enantioselective as well? Okay, so getting cracking, we can identify that this molecule has one key functional group, which is this ester. This molecule would often be called a lactone, and that's just a word for a cyclic ester like this. As always, esters can be disconnected like this. And in this case, forming the cyclic ester should be super easy, as it's an intramolecular process, and it's forming a six-membered ring, so pretty sensible. It should be possible to do this in the forward synthesis just by treating the substrate with catalytic acid. There are two hydroxyl groups here that could potentially cyclize, but we should expect some selectivity for forming a six-membered ring over a four-membered ring, as that ring size would be much less strained. Progressing in our retrosynthesis, we can now number the carbons. I consider the carbonyl the dominant functional group here, so counting one, two, three, four, five, so the other functional groups. It looks to me like there'll be a really good disconnection here between atoms two and three, and I can treat this as a one, three difunctional group relationship which are really easy to deal with using aldol chemistry. So what I'll need is a ketone on carbon free to act as an electrophile, ready for an enolate to attack it. And I could use methyl acetate to represent a two carbon fragment to make an enolate here at carbon two. That should be reasonably easy. Protons in that sort of environment, alpha to a carbonyl group, have a pKa in the early 20s. A pretty sensible way of making that enolate would be to use something like LDA at low temperature. That will give us a good multi-purpose enolate nucleophile. Now there's one thing we just need to quickly address here in that we have to be careful. There's an acidic proton kicking around on atom five. The problem is that that's more acidic than the proton we removed to make the enolate on carbon two. The pKa will be somewhere in the ballpark of 15. This will just destroy the enolate by protonation before we get the nucleophilic attack that we actually want. So therefore we're gonna need a protecting group. You can get away with most things here, but there's no particular reason not to use a silyl group because they're quite easy to handle. So perhaps we can make the silyl ether because they're pretty easy to deal with in general. Pretty easy to put on, pretty easy to take off in the presence of other functional groups. Okay, so just making that change, I'm just gonna put a general silyl group on there. You can pick your favorite one. A popular choice for something like that would be a TBS group. TBS is short for terp-butyl dimethyl silyl. It's a pretty sturdy group and it's pretty tidy in your proton NMR spectrum with just singlets present, generally out of the way of other peaks close to zero ppm. Disconnecting this hydroxy ketone next, we can identify that there's another one free difunctional relationship between those functional groups. So we can think about another aldol reaction there. Cutting across between atoms four and five, will give us a nice symmetrical ketone where we need to make an enolate here. And the other component we'll need is just propylene aldehyde. Both of these simple carbonyl compounds are readily available. And then that's the synthesis done. In terms of enolizing, I think we can use LDA again here because what we can do is chuck in the free pentanone followed by LDA at low temperature. That will make me a flask full of my enolate. And then I can add the aldehyde and all of the enolate will react with the aldehyde to give me the hydroxy ketone product. So to just summarize the forward synthesis, I can treat this ketone with LDA at minus 78 degrees. It's symmetrical, so an enolate will form on either side and it doesn't really matter. I'm not worried about any stereochemistry in this part of this discussion. I could chuck in my aldehyde to do the aldol reaction. Third, I need to put the silyl protecting group on. So I'm gonna use TBS triflate in the presence of 2,6-lutadine as a pretty good way of dealing with these slightly hindered secondary alcohols, which has some branching either side of it. 
The Silar group itself is quite bulky, so the idea is we put on a really good leaving group in this triflate, and the compatible hindered base for these sorts of reactions is this pyridine derivative. So those steps will get me to this molecule here. I'm going to add the lithium enolate of methyl acetate, which should attack my ketone in another aldol reaction. And then we can see that this was a cunning choice of protecting group, because if I pick a sufficiently strong enough acid, not too strong, but not too mild, but in some sort of aqueous conditions, I can both deprotect the silar group and then transesterify intramolecularly to cyclize up to my product. So we're all good for assembling the carbon skeleton. Now we should have a think about the stereochemistry. First, how can I make this synthesis diastereoselective? Now I don't need to completely reinvent the wheel with the synthesis, but I just need to modify some of the steps and use some slightly more sophisticated techniques to do the same type of chemistry, but with some slightly fancier reagents. Okay, so applying the same retrosynthesis ideas to the molecule in purple at the top, the original aldol disconnection here is going to require us to attack that ketone in a specific way. And we can see that the hydroxyl group being backwards in the starting material means that we're going to have to attack this carbonyl from the front face. So our synthesis is going to need to find a solution for that. Continuing on, I don't massively like the way that this structure is drawn here. I prefer to have my carbons in a chain when I've got linear systems. So I'm just going to rotate the molecule around a little bit. This is a pretty conventional thing to do. Hopefully it's reasonably easy to see. If I just give it a slight twist to rotate the ethyl group up, the hydrogen will move around and the t-butyl group will rotate round to the back. So what I'm doing here is rotating around this bond by about 30 degrees, like a turnstile kind of thing. So this is an equivalent representation of the same molecule. The aldol disconnection in the middle requires us to form an anti-relationship between those two stereocenters. Now both of those stereocenters are going to be impacted by this disconnection. In fact, it would be good if we can find a way to set both of them at the same time. And aldol technology long ago found a solution to this. What we need to make sure we do is we set a specific enolate geometry when we remove a proton from this ketone. And it turns out that chemistry will impact the aldol reaction as well and give us the product that we want. So note here that we're actually using the same chemistry ideas, but all we need to do to make the forward synthesis work is change some of the reagents. And I'll just run through those now. To make this first aldol step work, I'm going to need to treat my ketone with cyclohexyl boron chloride in the presence of triphylamine. This will form the e enolate geometry. I have another video on how that works in detail, and I'll link that in the description below. Second in the synthesis, I will have my aldehydes. Now the trick that gets played here is that I've still got an empty p orbital on this boron center. So this enolates can both act as a nucleophile, but also as a Lewis acid. Now coordinating on my aldehyde means that I will also activate the aldehyde, which makes it more reactive. But also when it's in this more reactive state, I can do the aldol reaction in an intramolecular sense, something like this. So here we have a six membered ring transition state and we can use the zinnemann traxler model to explain the result. The proposal of the model is that the lowest energy transition state should be in a chair conformation, but here there are technically two equal energy transition states as the product that we're forming is chiral. Those two starting materials, the enolate and the aldehyde, are both completely flat, as in achiral, so there'll be two mirror image transition states of the same energy, you could call them enantiotopic, that will form the two enantiomers of product as a racemic mixture. If we trace through those molecules, we can see the product reasonably easily by highlighting these yellow bits and also keeping an eye on where the hydrogens are. This one on the left, after oxidative workup, will give me these two stereocenters and the one on the right will give me the enantiomer that looks like this. So just to be super clear what we've got here, these two are both the enantiomers that are formed in a 50-50 mixture, i.e. racemic, because there's no difference in energy between those transition states. But all together, these are the antidiastereomer. So these reaction conditions are giving us the thing that we want at the top, but I'll just leave a note that what this is doing is forming this racemically. I'm just going to use the plus minus symbol for that. Okay, and then the final step after the aldol reaction would just be to silo protect again, and I'll just use the same conditions as before. Okay, next challenge to deal with is how can we attack just one face of the ketone? Now there's a few different types of approach here. 
One could be maybe if we had some sort of chiral enolate, it would inherently prefer interacting with that ketone from one face over the other. Another thing we could do is maybe add a chiral Lewis acid to coordinate to that ketone and again introduce a preference, maybe shield one of the faces rather than the other. But I think the easiest thing to do here would be to acknowledge that, well, that ketone is chiral anyway, so it might have a facial preference if we check. And this system is certainly a type of ketone that does have a facial preference, primarily because of this alpha stereocenter. It has three different sized groups, an R small, an R medium, and an R large. So the R small is just the hydrogen, the R medium is just the methyl group, and the other group that's coming off there is a much bigger branched alcohol group. In these circumstances, it turns out there's some restricted rotation and the Falcon R model applies. I've gone into great detail on the Falcon R model in another one of my videos. As an ultimate guide to this reactivity, I'll put a link in the description below. Because that alpha stereocenter is right next to the reacting center, it really is the dominant factor affecting stereoselectivity here. However, I should also note that it is possible to get stereoselective reactions when you have oxygenation in the beta position as well. This is a smaller effect. That beta stereocenter with an electronegative atom means that the Evans polar model applies. In these cases, the new hydroxyl group after attack of the nucleophile will be one free anti to that beta stereocenter. Now we've been incredibly lucky with this choice of molecule that if we apply both of these models, they both select for the facial selectivity for attack on that carbonyl that we want to give us the correct stereocenter in our product without us having to put any more effort in. I can draw a quick projection to show that. So the picture I'm just gonna draw is be looking down this um, plane inside the paper. Note that this is just an ethyl group. Building in the Falcon R model first, my R large group has to go perpendicular and my alpha stereocenter is just at the back here. And we can see in this arrangement, the nucleophilic attack will pass over the small hydrogen group. So just folding that molecule over with our alpha stereocenter, we can see that the attack from the front as drawn there. Building our Evans polar model into this system, the R large group has a beta stereocenter on it and the beta stereocenter will prefer to put its oxygenation at 180 degrees to the carbonyl to minimize the dipole moments between these two systems. In this arrangement with our stereochemistry, that will put a hydrogen in this position and the rest of the alkyl chain out the way. So there's minimal things clashing and this is a preferred confirmation. So this model would work even if the alpha stereocenter wasn't there, but both cases will put the large group preferably on the left-hand side and nucleophilic attack will come from the right-hand side. So the final steps of the synthesis mean we just need to make sure we put in a sensible enolate nucleophile for this. Now I should note that in the nucleophilic attack model, what we acquire is quite a simple attack. So just nucleophile intercarbonyl down the Berge Dunnitz trajectory, no problem. Specifically, one thing we don't want is any sort of zinnemann traxler like behavior that would interfere with the Falcon Arn model. For example, in our case, if I continue to use LDA, I would expect some sort of chelated transition state like this, but it's tricky to get well-defined chairs here when these two are both hydrogens. So the zinnemann traxler model tends to fall down in these situations, but even worse, I don't even have a hydrogen in an axial position on this transition state. Just a bit messy, probably not very selective. But that's okay, we can just use a simple enolate and a very good thing to use in these sorts of circumstances would just be to use this silyl ketene acetal. It won't collate to the ketone because the silicon's already full, but unfortunately it's not very nucleophilic as it is. These types of silyl compounds are pretty stable in the grand scheme of things, so we just need to give it a bit of a push by adding a Lewis acid to activate the ketone. A common useful one would be something like boron trifluoride in these cases. This type of chemistry has a name. This is an example of a Mukayama aldol reaction. And it works well for an aldol reaction where you don't want any chelation involved. Final step of this synthesis would then just be to remove our silyl protecting group. So perhaps we can just use, like we said before, some aqueous acid and then job done. Right, so now we have a fully working diastereoselective synthesis of this molecule. As indicated before, if we had a racemic intermediate, this method will only get a racemic product. And in some circumstances, we might want to make just one enantiomer of that product instead. So what would we do? Well, we can tinker with this synthesis a bit further 
I'm just going to make myself some more space. And we can just analyze these two processes. The one on the left, which uses the Falcon R model, this is a diastereo selective step. It relies on existing stereo centers to set up a single relative stereochemistry. Whereas the other reaction was not quite like that. So if I make a racemic middle intermediate here, I'm going to get a racemic product. So what we really need is just one enantiomer of this, and then we're done. So unfortunately, our reaction setup, although diastereoselective for the anti-relationship, we need to make this enantioselective. And that's as well as being diastereoselective using the boron enolate chemistry. Now this is a bit fiddlier, and we're going to need to introduce a chiral element somewhere into our reagents or starting materials. We could put some chiral ligands perhaps on the boron centre, or maybe we could use some sort of other chiral Lewis acid. But a really robust way of doing this would be to use a chiral auxiliary. The idea being that I'm going to modify my starting material to have a chiral auxiliary near the carbonyl, put it through a diastereoselective aldol reaction, but in this case, because there's an extra stereocenter, it will influence the outcome, and it will set those stereocenters in the product as one configuration. And then provided we can find some way of removing the auxiliary and adding on an ethyl group, we're job done. The two stereocenters in purple here have been set as one configuration, and so this final product will be as one enantiomer. So we sort of cheated a bit here. We put something chiral on because we've got a reliable diastereoselective process, but that diastereoselective process is influenced by nearby stereochemistry to favour one very particular transition state. That will give us one particular diastereomer of product, and then we remove the auxiliary and pretend it was never there in the first place. Now this is quite a big topic just on its own, and so I'm going to make a separate video on this. So please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, if you want an alert for when that drops, and if you have any ideas in the meantime, do drop them in the comments below.